Welcome to the Pat White Show. Let's get into it. This is Sparta! Hello everyone and welcome back in for another episode of the Pat White Show. Today I'm going to give you my perspective on the city of Fort Wayne as I see it. Now, this is my perspective, not yours. But I'm going to tell you a little bit about why I think about Fort Wayne the way I think about it. Because I have been a resident of this city since 1975. I came here simply because I was able to be uh, find a job after I got out of the United States Air Force in 1975 when the Vietnam War ended. I was stationed at the Grissom Air Force Base down in Kokomo, sent out hundreds of resumes. Nobody was hiring me except one company sent me an email back, or sent me a letter back and said, hey, we're interested in you because you have experience in public relations and media. And I came up, did the interview, and I was hired for the job. I was working at a company called General Telephone, GTE, located on West Jefferson, big building, about 250,000 square feet. That was the only thing out there back in those days on Jefferson in 69. Worked there until I found out something that was happening in the city of Fort Wayne called cable television. Started out in a little town of New Haven, Indiana. And I was intrigued by it because cable TV was cool and I knew what it was going to do. Ended up meeting the owner of that organization. His name was John Bonsib. And ended up working for him in cable TV. And I ended up getting involved in publishing of a, of a weekly cable TV magazine. Did that for a number of years. Got involved with radio. Ultimately television. More print. More broadcasting. In the media, there probably isn't much I haven't done. Anywhere from radio, television, print, outdoor, you name it, I've done it. And I have owned a number of companies and have sold a number of companies, followed media all the time, knew what was going on, saw what was happening. So in the years I was in, involved in sales, I literally saw everything happening in Fort Wayne. If a new building went up, I knew what it was because I thought well, maybe sell it advertising. I saw all the expansion of Fort Wayne over the years, and I can tell you, Fort Wayne's had some good stuff and some bad stuff. We have grown in some ways, and we have re retarded ourselves in certain other ways. I've seen some bad things happen, and some good things happen. Seen uh, someone try to assassinate a civil rights leader right in our city. Seen that. Seen presidents come here. I've seen annexation that's happened from a former mayor. He did what he felt he had to do because the city of Fort Wayne downtown was dying and he needed more tax revenue. I've seen the growth of areas from the southwest to the northeast. And now the massive growth is to the northwest. Fort Wayne is growing. But Fort Wayne has some things going on. I remember back in 1978, it was a January day. I happened to be single at the time and went over to a, a disco on Northwell Street called the Bombay Eagle. I think Helen Keenan Sentler, I believe, owned that place. It was a restaurant and a disco. It was a Wednesday night, my memory serves me right. Went over there because it's a disco. You know, that's what you did. And I remember about 10 o'clock, I guess, I went and looked out the front door and it was snowing like crazy. And I thought, man, this ain't good. So I said, I'm getting out of here. And I got out, jumped in my car, and it took me well over an hour to get back to where I lived because I lived in Canterbury Green. Everybody who was anybody back in the 70s lived in Canterbury Green. I can tell you, 1976 was a year of Canterbury Green like I've never experienced. But anyway, back to the uh, disco. Uh, got home. Snowstorm was big. It hit that night. And a lot of people were stuck in a lot of locations, one of which was the Bombay Eagle, where people were stuck there for, what, three days? Man, that couldn't have been a good time. I was stuck in Canterbury. I survived. But you know what? Back in those days, I can tell you some of the stores. There was a Rogers, the Maloli's. Yes, there was Scott's. But everybody survived. The uh, marketplace of Canterbury was a hub. You had the Rogers Market in there. You had Bubba's North, which was a, a watering old tavern that people frequented. And yet the city was growing. 
The Southwest side was the big money place people wanted to live because, well, that's where the money was. But eventually, the Northeast side started to grow. And yes, the Northeast side had their had their, their locations. Probably the best one was Arlington Park because, well, they had a golf course. They had a swimming pool. That's where the money was on the Northeast side. But eventually, the Northeast started to grow again. More and more development happened. More and more things happened out on the Northeast side. And pretty much, Northeast grew. I know that because I lived out there. And places like Cherry Hill developed, and all that area, all that area in the Cherry Hill area completely developed. That got big. And of course, there was traffic. And the traffic that existed in Fort Wayne was a, was a mess. You couldn't get from point A to point B without going through 10 hundred, a thousand traffic lights. Truck drivers used to call this Stoplight City. Those coming in from Ohio having to curve up on, on Coliseum Boulevard. And Coliseum was a mess. Well, ultimately, the government said, I think we ought to build a circle around Fort Wayne, and that was the start of 469. Took a while for it was developed, but it came along, and eventually 469 now exists. But now the new growth in the city of Fort Wayne has gone northwest. 46825, 46845, 46748, all of that area, that's the new blossoming area. Because back in the old days, you know, DuPont Road was nothing more than two lanes. And there was nothing there but farmland. I know, because I used to drive it. And then Lima Road, gee, the White Swan Grocery was about the farthest thing you got out in Lima Road. Oh, and there was a camper place out there. And I think uh, Preferred Auto opened up a spot there eventually because that was the land they could get. All that's changed now. DuPont Road, two lane, not anymore. Lima Road, two lane, not anymore. Everything has blossomed. Fort Wayne has gotten bigger and Fort Wayne population has grown. Things have happened. Businesses have gone up and down. Remember, downtown used to be Lincoln Life. Not that way anymore. Downtown is a lot of different things nowadays. Heck, I remember back in the old days at the Summit Club at the top of the Fort Wayne Bank Building. That was the place for the rich and famous to go hobnob and sell stuff to people. I know because I did it. That was then. Doesn't exist now. Things have changed. Society has changed because generations have changed. We've seen things happen with the Coliseum over the years. It's gotten bigger. Now they charge eight bucks to park, believe it or not. There was a Fort Wayne Wizards on the Coliseum grounds. Remember those days, the Wizards? Well, now everything moved downtown. Now you've got Parkview Field downtown, and it is a glorious field considered one of the finest in the minor league baseball in the United States by the people who rate these things. I think we're in the top two or three or whatever it is. It's a great place. Brought things downtown. Downtown's starting to come back to life. I'll give the mayor credit for that. Those things happen. But everything changes. With the generations, it changes. Life changes. Things change. The world changes. And that's what we live in, a changing world. But Fort Wayne, through it all, is an all-American city that has been an all-American city more than once. And frankly, I've had many chances over the years to leave Fort Wayne and go to other big cities, bigger cities. And yes, I've strayed. Yep. I was down in Florida for a while. Uh, it's a retirement. <laughs> Came back. I've worked in radio, as you guys well know. And I have seen things and done things more than most people have done, because I've lived here almost 50 years. And there's not anything in me I probably haven't done. So yes, I have opinions, and I'm going to tell you what I think. You may not agree with it. That's your call. But I'm still going to tell you what I think from my observation and my years of living here. I'm not a native. I am not. I'm a Texas boy. But I ended up here, and I like it here. This is a good city. My wife was born here. My daughters were born in Parkview. And frankly, I happen to like Fort Wayne because it's a city that fits me. Can't say that for every place. Can't say that for everyone. But I will tell you this. There's worse places you could live. And are yes, there are probably better places. I'm not going to argue. But when you take a look at this city, our affordability, what we have, and how we're making things work, and the cost of living in this city, it ain't a bad place to live. 
coming up next. Hello, everyone, and welcome in for another lecture. Well, yeah, it's a lecture. What, what can I say? All right, I want to talk about something that uh, most of you probably know about. You know, in today's world, almost everybody has internet. Most folks do. And many folks have all sorts of social media sites, and there are a ton of them that exist. And you can think about the WhatsApp and the the Facebook and the um, uh, X, all these different sites that exist. And there is one interesting one that kind of uh, has gotten my attention a little bit because it's something that is more localized. The application is called Nextdoor. I don't know who designed it, who created it, but it does exist. And it's one of those websites designed for a local community, whether it's this community or some other community around the United States. It's a nationwide uh, website, but it's selective for community. And when you sign up, you tell them what zip code you live in, and it literally saturates your, your website, your what you download you get, with the things that exist in your particular town. And it could be in the north side, south side, east side, west side, doesn't really matter. But it's focused on your town, so people keep asking questions or making comments about things that are local and kind of deal with you and I. All right, it's called Nextdoor. So if you don't have it, you can get, it doesn't cost you anything, but it's kind of a, it's an interesting local social media for your community. And in this case, Fort Wayne. Now, I'm sure they exist in other cities. It's not a big deal. But so I see people posting things, asking questions, and I go, okay, fine. Do I respond? Not that they're asking me a question because they're not, but they're posing a question for the populace of that social media site. And I have seen some things that people have asked about, and I have sometimes commented. And unfortunately, when I comment, I tend to write a doctoral thesis. Just me, that's my journalism, and it comes up to bite me once in a while. But the most recent one I saw was someone posted a piece, an overhead video shot of a piece of land, and probably done from Google Earth or whatever it was. And it showed the outline of a section of land right next to the old AMC theater complex right off of DuPont and Diebold in that area. And it's outlined that uh, that, the open ground that exists on the west side of the AMC theater. And they said, what is that going to be? Something's going on. They're building something. Something's being created. Well, I'm curious like everybody else. And I thought, hmm. So somebody's starting to develop that thing. And that got my mind to thinking. Well, as you know, the AMC theaters, when they opened up, they were planning on the growth going on. They are planning on the northwest side to be the next huge growth area. And frankly, it is. But that theater didn't count on two things happening. One was the COVID mess, where nobody was going to theaters and they lost business. And nobody wanted to go into a theater for fear of getting sick with something. So nobody went. Ultimately, AMC went bust. And that place is now just a shell of its former self. But it's an interesting piece of property because it's right there off of DuPont Road, right there off of Diebold. And that's prime real estate, boys and girls. I don't care what you say, what you think. That's prime real estate. Now, to the east, you've got the Meyer and all the stuff that Meyer is going, you know, all those areas out there, hotels, all the stuff that's happening. Look, you better understand something. DuPont East, which is the area from I-69 all the way east toward Tonkel, whether you like it or not, is about to turn into Coliseum Boulevard Part 2, or Part Du, if you're French. I remember the days back in Fort Wayne when Illinois Road was farmland. I know, because I drove up and down it. I've got enough experience in the media in this town to tell you I've seen everything and I know what the heck is going on because I was in sales. And when you're in advertising sales, you watch every single building going up regardless of what it is because you think maybe you can sell them some advertising or whatever services you had. So yes, I remember Illinois Road being nothing. Today, I don't want to drive on Illinois Road. I mean... I was out there yesterday, and I'm going, man, I don't want to be on this road. It's everything. I mean, there's, you can't, 
There's no open space on Illinois Road. You go from Jefferson all the way out to, to the 69, it's packed full of stuff, and there's things go, going there all the time. That's what's happened. Businesses grow. They want to they look for places to expand. Well, such is what's happening now that Lima Road has expanded out. Let's be honest, Lima Road used to be farthest. Lima Road used to be two lanes. Farthest you would go on Lima Road was like White Swan Plaza. And then I think Preferred Auto bought property there and never crossed the street. It was a, uh, a camper company there that sold campers, RVs, whatever. That was it. Two lane road. You went on, the father you drove north, you were looking at soybean fields and corn fields and nothing. But Lemmer Road has changed too. Lemmer Road, four lane road, Walmart, every single business you can think of, housing developments out there, it's growing like a weed. And then, of course, DuPont Road. Now, I remember when DuPont Road, when the early 70s or in the 70s and 80s, there's nothing. I mean, it was just farm, farmland. That's all there was. Two lanes. DuPont Road ain't the same, folks. You go up Mayhew and turn out in DuPont, it was just two lanes, and there were trailer parks and cornfields. That's all there was. But, hey, life moves on. You know, years ago, there was a guy who wanted to build a hockey rink over there where the Parkview North uh, Hospital is. He didn't get it approved, obviously, but Parkview Field or Parkview Hospital did get themselves approved, and that's where they built a huge facility, and when you build a medical facility, everything else is going to grow around it. You got DuPont Hospital over there on DuPont, the other side of the road. You've got medical facilities in that whole area and housing developments, Pine Valley, all those other, Autumn Ridge, all those developments out there. And that was on the west side. But now the east side, things are happening. Oh, yeah, it started out. I remember um, Gerber Auto built a, built a place over there in Bowl. There was nothing else there. And I asked uh, Mr. Gerber, I said, why are you building it there? He said, it's going to grow. And he was right. Eventually, the Doms built the Mike's Car Wash there. Then, Mar then, uh, then you get Meyer coming in and all the things that started to develop on DuPont. And then more developed. Building here, company there. A uh, trailer park was torn down and infrastructure was built. And it sat there for what seemed like a couple of years. Hey, they had roads, but nothing was built. Well, guess what? Things are starting to be built in there. Because that area is the hottest area in the city of Fort Wayne. That's where it's going to grow. So anyway, this property over there next to the AMC... And they said, well, what is it going to be? And then be get people with their comments, some snarky or whatever. But so I said, when I wrote my piece, I said, hey, check the zoning. Check and see what the zoning is going on. Has it been changed? What is it now? If it's being changed, what's it being changed to? But here's something to think about. Yes, the AMC building is, it's going to be torn down. But they've got something else pretty cool. They've got a huge parking lot. So, ask yourself this. A place with an area with a huge parking lot, plenty of land that can be developed, what on earth could you put in that area where you tear down the, the uh, theaters and that big plot of land just to the west of it, what could you do with that? What would be something that the people on the northwest side would flock to, would want to utilize, and maybe people from other parts of the city would come to it, and especially when you have the entire Parkview area and now you've got new medical developments going on. I mean, hey, universities are developing properties right there at Union Chapel and, and I-69. It's growing, folks. It is growing massively. So what could you put in that property? What could be built there? Is it something that somebody may be thinking about building? A developer, for, we got some good developers in Fort Wayne, and they know how to make things happen. So what could they put on that property? If you look at it from the sky down, it's that big and saying, hmm, what could they create with that property? Now, obviously, you've got to have, you know, the roads have got to change a little bit. You've got to expand things out, but they can do it. 
So my question is, what's going to happen to the property on the AMC theater and all that land next to it? Right now, I don't know. But I'll bet something's going on. And time will tell when we find out. Coming up next. Hello, everyone, and welcome back into this edition of the Pat White Show. I want to tell you about something that happened to me a couple of days ago when I received a text message. Now, like all of us, we get text messages from lots of places, people we know, and this one was different. This one had my name on it, and it was from a company called Dynata, D-Y-N-A-T-A, Dynata, and I thought, who is Dynata? Because I'd never heard of that company before. But they said, hey, would you fill out this survey? Now, yeah, I can be stupid sometimes, but uh, in this case, I said, well, let's take a look and see what the survey is about. And uh, turns out it was a survey in involving politics. Now, I have never in my entire life been surveyed by any, any particular organization involving political stuff. Never. I know you hear about people being polled on this poll and that poll and what they like and who they like and what have you. I've never had a poll in my life, ever. I thought, well, this is weird. I've never had one. This Dynata, well, it turns out Dynata is a legitimate company. They started back in 1999 as a company called E-Rewards. A uh, bunch of acquisitions later and uh, name changes, and ultimately it became known as Dynata. They are headquartered in Texas and in Connecticut. Now, mainly what they do is they run surveys about things about automobiles, healthcare, media, financial services, but political ones, that was a new one. And so I received uh, questions about politics, namely about, uh, do I like what the governor of Indiana has done? Didn't ask me who I was interested in in seeing the, uh, the next governor. Didn't get any questions about that. Got the standard stuff about, you know, your 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 income, your age, your sex, your married, whatever. But they started asking me questions about uh, political things involving presidential election and my attitude towards certain issues that America seems to be thinking about, or actually not thinking about, they're concerned about. And I got all these different questions, and uh, they finally said, well, you know, who are you likely to vote for? Who are you thinking of, of going for? Who do you like? That kind of stuff. And I was just kind of reluctant to answer it because I didn't know who the heck I'm talking to and why I'm talking to them. But, stupid me, I went ahead and did it anyway and filled out the rest of the form. But it was political. And it wasn't uh, one party or another. It was just saying, who do you like? Who do you think is, uh, who are you going to vote for? How often do you vote? You know, do Have you voted over a number of years? Those kind of things. Just kind of getting the lay of the land about who I was and what I did and what I'm thinking about. So it's going to give them a pretty good picture of, of who on earth I am. But this dynamic people. Now, here's the deal. Um, you may get called by them. You may get a, a, a text message. And I was trying to figure out, how did they find my name? That's another thing I thought. How did this company find my name and who I am and my phone number? And then I got to thinking, maybe it was the Bureau of Motor Vehicles, because apparently in the state of Indiana, the BMV will sell the information they have about you to companies, like Dynata, apparently. That's my guess. I can't say it was from the BMV. I don't know. But they did get my phone number, because that's how they text me. I did know my name. And how they knew my name, I don't know. But the company is called Dynata. They are legit. They're out of Texas. They're out of Connecticut. If you get calls and you don't want to hear from them because you don't like being bugged by them, there's a phone number you could call. It's 833-757-1746. 833-757-1746. And tell them you want to be off their contact list. Uh, that's simple. But it did happen to me. I did get polled, and they asked me about the presidential election and who I'm thinking about. And I'm, and like I said, I have never in my entire life ever been polled for anybody for anything. First time. Dinata did it. Where will it, that information end up? I don't know. But probably some political party bought it. But how they got my name and how they got my phone number to me remains a mystery. 
Somebody sold it to them. I don't know who, but it may happen to you. Just let you know what's going on. So if it happens, you understand who Dinata is. And they're legit. You want to answer the questions? That's your call. In my case, I did, but I never have in the past. Coming up next. Hello, everyone, and welcome back into the Pat White Show. Today, we're going to be talking about NBC News has found out the reason that the shooting at the Kansas City uh, parade involving the Super Bowl, what the reason was and how it occurred. And many of you are saying, well, how did the people start shooting at each other? Well, this is typical male macho testosterone at its worst. So let me explain to you. Apparently, four males approached a gentleman by the name of Lindell Mays. And one of, the, one of these four teenagers asked Lindell what he was looking at. And that started the whole thing? Apparently so. So you get thin-skinned teenagers full of testosterone being stupid. And they were. This is what we're getting in today's society. So you get them waving around guns, start shooting at each other because they're too doggone impulsive and stupid and worrying about what you're looking at. And that results in the death of a woman who had nothing to do with this entire situation. They're little macho games. There were other uh, 20 people shot, wounded. Tens of thousands were emotionally impacted. And millions, that's right, millions of others now have to think about, gee, do I want to go to a party? Do I want to go to a football game, a sporting event, soccer game, basketball game, or parade, or any sports-related gathering? Because there could be some teenagers in there who say, what you looking at? And as a result, a fight starts, and they haul out the big guns and start leveling everybody around them. That's exactly what happened, folks, and that's what's going on. That's because we have teenagers today who have no regard for anybody else because they were raised without someone kicking their butt when it needed to be kicked. Statistics already show that. I'm not making this up. you got 70% of the single mothers in, in homes of the of unfortunate African-American kids, 70% single mothers. Where did this all come from? Try the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Look it up. That tells you exactly how this mess started. And today we have kids with no fathers running around with gangs acting like idiots because they're full of testosterone and they got handguns stuck in their belt, which are illegal in the first place. They don't care. Laws don't mean anything to them. Why should it? Because they know they're juveniles. Can't do anything to juveniles, can you? Well, that's what happened. So think about it. The next time you want to go to a party, you want to go to a, a concert, you want to go to a football game, a baseball game, a basketball game, or even a, I don't know, a parade. Someone may come up and say to you, what are you looking at? And then pull out a gun and start blazing. That's what happened in Kansas City, friends. Hello, everyone. Well, I want to give you the latest on the Kansas City shooting, what we know up to this point. The prosecutors down there have announced that uh, uh, Lindell Mays of Raystown and Dominic Miller of Kansas City are both linked to the weapons and have been charged with second-degree felony murder in the shooting. Now, here's the situation. They found guns. One is a Taurus G3 9mm, the other is a Glock 9mm. That Glock had six rounds of ammunition in a 15-round capacity magazine, and there was a live round found in the uh, chamber. They also found the Taurus. So two guns were found, but apparently the uh, that's what they found, the two guns. And the ballistics, they checked it out, ballistics, that hit that woman and killed her coming from one of the guns. So that's what they know right now. 
They've also collected a number of 9mm shell casings, but according to the story I read, they also collected 40mm shell casings, and that doesn't make any sense to me because if everybody was shooting 9mm, where do 40mm casings come from? That still doesn't work for me. I'm having a problem with that. But that's something that's going on. But here's the bigger thing. The mother of Lundell Mayer, his mom, she set up a GoFundMe account for her son, who's in the hospital and accused of murdering a woman. She set up a GoFundMe account. I'm not making this up. The woman's name is Tennille Burnside. In the message, she asked people to help her son with his medical bills during this tragic time. Really? How much money do you think people donated to me page by the time it was taken down by whoever takes down GoFundMe pages? I don't know who does that, but it's been taken down. Well, she said, wait a minute, I, I, let me get this to you. This is great. I ask all, please help by donating to help him with his medical bills during this tragic time he is going through. He's in the ICU fighting for a recovery from several surgeries, from going through the Chief Super Bowl celebration with his older sister to getting shot multiple times at the time that it was meant to bring so much joy to so many has brought pain and sadness to all who was attending. Her son started shooting, and she wants a GoFundMe page to say, please help my son out. Give him money. The GoFundMe page was shut down. The amount of money that was earned during the time is a grand total of $100. I don't know who sent $100. But there it is, the mother of the young man who's in the hospital being shot up because he started a, sh a shooting war and shot all kinds of people and then got himself shot. His mother says, oh, he needs help. Please help him. Donate to him. Yeah. Go fund me. hundred bucks. Now you know the rest of the story. Hope you're enjoying that one. See ya. Coming up next. Well, hello, everyone. And once again, it's time to talk about trials. The trials and tribulations of the son of President Biden, Hunter Biden, and the latest situation involving his attorneys and the prosecution of said son, Hunter. Well, apparently the prosecution has... Uh, pulled out another piece of evidence, and they've made it public, and it's a picture. And it's a picture from the, uh, from the camera, from the, the, the software, the, the, uh, the iBook or iPhone or whatever he was using to take pictures, that uh, shows a, uh, three lines of what looks like cocaine on a wooden board. And according to the prosecution, they said, uh, this photo was taken by Hunter, and it proves that he was uh, doing cocaine, took his own picture. Well, the defense attorney said, oh, pshaw, oh, hogwash. Why, that should be that should be out of the movie Police Academy. It's so outrageous that the prosecution would say that. That's not cocaine. Why, that picture wasn't even taken by Hunter. It was taken by a master craftsman who said it to him, and what you're seeing there are not lines of cocaine, but are Merely lines of sawdust. Really? Lines of sawdust. And this is what the defense is presenting as evidence from their side in the trial of Hunter Biden. And he was saying, well, that, 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 that photograph, he, he didn't take that photograph. It was sent to him. And it was lines of sawdust. What, pine, oak, walnut, or cocaine? Oh, it can't be cocaine. It's sawdust. All right. 
Hey, let me explain you something. Years ago, my attorney told me something. He said, when you get into trial, he said, there's three things you can do. He said, if the facts are on your side, you argue the facts. Now, he says, if the law is on your side, you argue the law. But if neither is on your side, he said, you muddy the water. You just say anything you could possibly think of to screw up things and make it look totally crazy. I think the attorneys for Hunter Biden has forgotten number one and number two because maybe number one and number two ain't going to work. But number three, muddy the water, apparently is exactly what they're doing. Or as some people would say, pounding the table. Your Honor, I object, pounding the table. So in this case, they're saying, hey, why this is not a police story movie? Police Academy, it's a comedy. That's what they're saying. I don't know about you, but when you hear this story, and it's been on the news, you're going to say, um, lines of sawdust? Give me a break. Just something to pass along to you. A little uh, levity in today's uh, Pat White Show. See, I don't cover everything strange, serious. No, I do the funny stuff sometimes. Man, this is funny. See ya. Coming up next. All right, let's talk about another issue that's going on, and this time I'm going to take us to Chicago, Illinois. It seems the city of Chicago is suing every major oil company in the United States, claiming they are responsible for global warming. I'm not making this up. This law, a law firm, it's called... Um, Let's see, it's a, let me get their name here. Sure Edling, Sure Edling of California. It's not a Chicago law firm. It's a California firm that specializes in suing cities over global warming. So they're the ones suing the, the, uh, all the, all the oil companies around the United States, suing all of them saying, you caused global warming and the tail is the 1995 blizzard. And because we had a blizzard in uh, Chicago in 1995, it was caused by the pollution of global warming put on by the oil companies and their fossil fuel. They're saying that big oil has lied to the American people for decades about the climate risk, the catastrophic climate risk of their products now in the city of Chicago and communities across the country are rightfully insisting they pay for the damages they cause. This is about money. That's what it is. And this is what they're saying is wrong. Chicago is the third largest city in uh, joining the fray. So it's going to be a mess. But they're suing the big oil, saying, you cause global warming. And it dates back to 1995. I don't know what happened in 1995. It was a blizzard or whatever. But they said, you caused it, and they filed a 200-page lawsuit. California law firm, huge lawsuit, six major oil companies are being sued. You've got to just love some of the stuff that's going on in today's society. There are some wacky people out there doing nothing but trolling for money, claiming Global warming is caused by big oil. No, global warming is cyclical. We have that. We have global cooling in 1977, I believe it was. Yeah, I'm going to go with that one. I believe it was Newsweek magazine. Newsweek magazine headline about are we going to freeze to death from global cooling? That was the front page story. Newsweek. It's cyclical. Sometimes we have heat, sometimes we have cool, and the main thing that controls all of it and has for centuries, the sun. That's right, the sun controls everything. The sun is blasting us down with rays that do all kinds of stuff. And that's why we have global warming. That's why we have so-called global cooling, because the sun works in space in mysterious ways that we still don't know. 
Now, as long as it keeps burning, we're going to be pretty good. But right now, well, you want to sue somebody in Chicago? Sue the sun, just saying. And that's not the sun times. Just my thought. Coming up next. Hello, everyone. Let's uh, talk about something else involving our country, and better yet, our flag. I had a, someone uh, ask me a question, which was kind of interesting, and said, uh, hey, I've seen an American flag flying upside down. Isn't that illegal? Well, let me explain to you exactly what that means. Anybody in the military will know this, and, and they'll, they'll tell you this. If a flag is shown flying upside down, it actually it is a signal, a signal of dire distress in instances of uh, extreme danger to life and to a property. So it's, a, it's an emergency thing that says, hey, this is life and death situation. This is emergency. This is big. And it's flown in a lot of different situations. It's been flown in, uh, in, in battles. It's been flown, I understand, it's been flown in, in, in certain areas of the United States. People will have a, a, a Donald Trump flag at, at the top of a pole and underneath it, the American flag flying upside down. And that's really kind of wrong because the American flag should be above any flag regardless. Uh, American flag should be above anything. It shouldn't be below anything. That's just my opinion. But here's the point. There are people that are flying banners that have a Trump banner with the American flag upside down beneath it, which basically is a single of, of dire distress, of extreme danger of life or property. Supreme Court's already said this, and, and more than one time, you've seen people, the flag burning stuff, and it ends up at court, and the Supreme Court says, hey, that's freedom of speech, whether you like it or not, as long as the person who decides they're going to burn the flag owns the flag, you know, it's their flag, they can do what they want. Now, somebody else's flag, that's a whole other story. So if somebody decides they're going to burn somebody else's flag, well, then you're destroying somebody else's property. we got a whole uh, different set of issues right there to work with. But if you're doing something on your own, it's your flag, and you can do what you want. It may not make some people happy, but it is what it is. So. For those folks that are flying banners that say, you know, Trump and uh, beneath it, it's got the American flag upside down, just means it's a signal of distress according to the U.S. flag code. So if you're wondering about that, can you do it? Yes, you can. It means dire distress. Those folks who are doing it, that's their opinion. And they're entitled to their opinion because we live in America. We have the First Amendment. It's called the freedom of speech. You may not like it. It may offend you. But it's still freedom of speech. That's all I got to say. See ya. Coming up next. Hello, everyone, and welcome into this edition of the Pat White Show. Today, we're going to be talking about something that's probably going to affect, or at least irritate, some of you. Some of you are going to say, yeah. Some of you are going to agree, disagree, whatever. But we're going to talk about this because it's, it's very important, and it deals with this country and how we got to where we are. And I remember all of this because I'm old. I saw all this happening, and I just wrote this down because it caught my attention over the years. So I've entitled the entire thing, What Changed America in 1964? That's the name of the piece I wrote. Well, in, back in 1964, black and white families were pretty much alike. Uh, we married, we raised kids, worship, worked. At least that's what I saw in my life, in all the places I've lived. Um, sometimes, though, it was separately. I'll tell you what, that happened in certain parts of the country worse than others, except the military. Now, there everybody was the same because the color meant nothing. It was the content of your character and had to do with your ability to accomplish a mission. So I know because I was there and I watched it close up. I saw it. Well, back in 1964, Lyndon Baines Johnson, LBJ, was the president. He took over after Kennedy was assassinated. and. He was a segregationist. Now, I don't care what you say, LBJ was a segregationist. 
And he was like most of his Democrats. That's the way the party was in the 60s. But he realized that his party needed black votes to stay in power. That's what this is all about, staying in power. So he said, well, you know, uh, for many years, blacks weren't allowed to vote. That's, that was unfortunate. It was wrong. But once they were allowed to vote, he wanted to make sure they voted for Democrats instead of Republicans because he needed power. So what he did was he created something called the Civil Rights Act of 1964. You could go look this up if you want. Well, he and his, uh, his fellow Democrats, okay, understand, this is LBJ's plan. The Democrats fought him tooth and nail on this. I mean, it was because they believed that blacks were inferior and giving them more rights and government benefits went against everything they possibly believed. That's how it was in 64. I'm sorry. You may not like it, but that's the way it was. Well, Republicans, on the other hand, said, hey, this is a pretty good idea. We could get uh, get get votes. And um, that's what they wanted. And so this is all about power getting votes, folks. So they said, hey, we're going to endorse this thing. And they did. Well, war broke out in the walls of Congress. Believe me, it did. But LBJ was determined to get this legislation done. And so he sided with the Republicans against the Democrats. He sided with it. He went against his own party and said, no, I'm going for this. I'm going to sign it. Republicans, you pass it. I'm going to sign it. And he did. Well, the bill was eventually voted on, and it passed because, but Democrats voted 100% zero. Look up the voting thing, zero votes. Republicans said yes, and they were in the minority, so the bill passed. And ultimately, it changed America as America we knew it. America was about to change dramatically, and it did. Well, eventually, what happened was, the act introduced something called welfare. Now, I'm going to, you might as well follow me on this. Welfare. And it completely altered society to a degree that actually exists today. It's probably worse today than it was. It, here's what it did. It changed the sanctity of marriage. That's the way we knew it. You know, back in the 1960s, marriage was between a man and a woman, regardless of the skin color. If a male got a female pregnant, he did the honorable thing. The honorable decision was to marry her, raise a family, a mother and a father. That's the way it was back then. But it started to change with a new welfare. If a man impregnated a woman back then, he was no longer morally forced to marry her and become a responsible father. Nope, didn't work out that way. Under the LBJ legislation, here's what happened. An unmarried woman could apply for welfare and the government would pay her a monthly stipend for each child that she conceived because there was no longer a man responsible for raising the family. No guy was there. He left. The woman got welfare. So a man no longer had to take responsibility for his actions. And a woman could be paid for each child that she brought into the world. Sounded like the right thing to do for an unmarried woman, but in reality... It ended up developing into a mentality that men could father children, not marry the mother, mother rather, and support the family and the government. That's us, taxpayers. We would pay for each and every child he fathered out of wedlock. And that continues even today. That's what's going on. Well, anyway, so government then decided that anyone under a certain income level, because this is all part of the Civil Rights Act, should be paid a monthly welfare check to ensure they weren't totally destitute. Soon, certain members of society realizes they no longer had to marry but could have multiple children with numerous women, and they would all receive money from the government for each child. And since uh, they didn't have to work, they knew they would get a monthly government handout. That's what happened. The traditional family unit, as I remember it, even in the black society, began to change dramatically, and it did. Government was now supporting unmarried mothers and supporting people that didn't work. It was a handout, and it got worse. 
Well, here's the thing. The Democrats despise the Civil Rights Act. They did totally. But they suddenly began to realize something. And what they realized was, hmm, um, you know, this, uh, this could work out for us. This could be a pretty good, uh, pretty good concept because the Democrats realized they could uh, utilize the African-American population. The voting bloc would support them if they increased the benefits offered under the original legislation that LBJ passed. More benefits. To that, they expanded the law to allow money and benefits to be given to those who abandon the traditional families, pass the laws. This resulted in a particular faction of, of, of America becoming lifelong Democrats, and frankly, that's what exists today. So, but the uh, mentality took another drastic turn when the percentage of unmarried women with children dr dramatically increased in the black population. Why did that happen? Well, statistics show that 70% of black women are unmarried with children. Sorry, that's the number. You don't have to like it, but it is what it is. In the white population, the number was around 30%. Now, that has been going up. The disintegration of the traditional black family was occurring at exponential rates. Now, it should be noted the percentage of white unmarried women with, uh, with kids is growing, and I'll tell you what, it's going up too. It ain't good, but it's going up because marriage has changed in recent years. But the financial benefits approved by the government are now available to everyone, regardless of race. I don't care who they are. Now, if you look at society, the African Americans make up approximately 12% of our population, roughly 50% men, 50% women. But you got to note something. Black men who make up only 6% of society commit roughly 50% of all crimes in the U.S. Difficult number. That's according to the FBI, not according to me. And this says resulted in many black families. The father is no longer there to guide and raise the kids like he's supposed to be. So if a child has no father to keep him on the straight and narrow, things could go pretty south pretty quickly. And when you had the drug culture, but it's invaded all, all aspects of society. The destruction of families of all colors is ongoing and getting worse. It is. And that all dates back to a law in 1964 by a party that believed they were acting in the benefit of, of women. And uh, they figured, hey, this would be a great thing that could develop the racial minority into a mentality that would make them devoted to the Democratic Party for life. That started in 1964. Give them plenty of stuff, they're going to say, yeah, we're going to vote for Democrats. They give us stuff. But the issue of crime in America has become a crucial issue, folks. It is, and you know it. There are many black young men and women who, frankly, have excelled regardless, and I mean regardless, of uh, what's happened, the hardships they've had in life, Lack of a father figure, they have made it. And I've met some of them. I know some of them. And they ought to be applauded for their grit, their determination, and the thing that passing everything else, they're successful. In spite of what happened in 1964. But unfortunately, there's countless families who weren't that lucky, and there are many problems that exist. An example is when a, a young, usually young males, kid grows up without a father. No father figure in the home, and they uh, they look to find a father figure. Sorry, that's what they do. A fatherless boy seeks to emulate someone, and he'll seek anyone who he admires. And when that concept gets to going, and kids are looking for a father figure, somebody they can admire. And sadly, a lot of older males attract younger males to become part of their organizations. We call them crime families. We call them gangs. Those organizations exist because they consider the leader of a gang to be their, quote, father. 
hundreds and thousands of maybe millions of young males and some females, by the way, now have uh, someone to look up to and admire because, well, because these so-called leaders have become their substitute fathers. That's what's happened. And because of all the drug culture that's gone on, these young men and women, they see it as their way to riches where they don't have to work, no benefit of working. They get what they want. They become rich, wear fancy gold and everything else. There's consequences that happen with that over time. This leads to things like turf wars, gangs, and violence, which has been disseminated to many of their race. You don't need to look any farther than Chicago, New York City, Los Angeles, Pittsburgh, Philadelphia, to see that violent crime is innate in the culture and that many, and for many, that leads to incarceration in a growing prison system, which is continuing to grow every day. Crime begets more crime, folks. But can society revert to the uh, pre-1964 family culture that existed back then? Can we? Pretty good question. But society, sadly, has dissolved into tribes. That's where we are today. We are tribes who battle over nearly everything in everyday society. We battle. And the biggest issue is for each tribe in which the ethnic minority owes it to the allegiance to that tribe. We are tribes today, folks, whether you like it or not, except we call it something else. Politics. Now you know. See ya. Coming up next. Hello, everyone, and let me tell you about the story of woe for a little community called Ilion, located about 230 miles northwest of New York City in New York. Ilion, New York. Population around 7,600 people, and they are losing the number one employer in their entire small village in the New York Valley. That company is closing down. Not just closing down. They're doing what a company like International Harvester did in Fort Wayne, Indiana, back in the 1980s when they closed down and moved to another state. Same thing is happening to this little, this little, uh, this little town in, in upstate New York with a population of 7,600. Now, Fort Wayne had a tough time of it, believe me. It was a bad time when Harvester closed down in Fort Wayne. Fortunately, GE came in and hired a bunch of folks, most of them from uh, Wisconsin. But we survived because we were a bigger city. We were a couple hundred thousand. This is a little town in New York with 7,600 people, the majority of whom work at a factory called Remington. That's right, Remington Arms. Remington Arms has been around for hundreds of years and has changed company ownership multiple times. And frankly, used to have around, I don't know, around 3,000 employees. Now it's down to less than 1,000 in their headquarters. Old buildings, been around, like I said, for a couple hundred years. But Remington and their new owners have said, hey, you know what? Um, we can't stay here anymore. Yeah, we used to employ a lot of people, but now we're down around 300. We're losing money because this factory is old. It's costing us big. And we have decided... We're going to move. What's Remington doing? They are moving to Georgia. That's right. Remington is taking lock, stock, and barrel, moving everything up and moving to Georgia. You want to know why? Because New York's an anti-gun state. Georgia is not. As a matter of fact, Georgia also has another manufacturer there that used to be in Miami, Florida. They moved up to Georgia. Company is called Taurus. Anybody who knows anything about handguns knows what a Taurus is. They're the leader in making revolvers, but they also make some very good semi automatic pistols. I don't know because, you know, I got them. But Remington, Remington Arms, 
packing up and leaving Ilion, New York, and leaving everybody in a lurch because there is nothing else in that city, and it's going to cause them to collapse like a cheap suitcase. And yet, Remington's moving out. You want to know why? Because they were sued in New York. New York had a lawsuit against them because they sued for everything in New York. As, you know, you might want to ask Donald Trump about being sued. Well, the whole thing involving Sandy Hook that happened back in 2012, Remington was sued and order, awarded a, a, a penalty of $73 million. Part of that lawsuit involving Sandy Hook mass shooting. So they said, hey, we're done. We're moving. Remington Arms, famous company nationwide, been around for hundreds of years, and moving to the state of Georgia because Georgia is gun-friendly. Just something to think about as you careen down the highway. Now you know something you didn't know. Thanks for listening. See ya. Coming up next. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Pat White Show once again. And today we're going to be talking about the dreaded thing, politics. But this is kind of interesting because Donald Trump has announced, or at least given a hint, at who he thinks his vice presidential running mate is going to be. And he did that when he was down in Greenville, South Carolina, talking to the media. And he said, uh, they said, well, who, who's on your short list? Who are you thinking about there, sir? And he said, well... Here's what I'm thinking about. He said, uh, kind of thinking about Ron DeSantis. Of course, you know he and Trump had a, you know, they were tearing at each other a little bit. Tim Scott, Senator Tim Scott in South Carolina, who was running for president himself, but then suddenly said, no, nah, I'm not going to do it. And he's been an enthusiastic fan of Trump. So here's a black senator from South Carolina uh, saying uh, he could be a potential. And then you've got the millionaire biotech engineer, Vivek Ramaswamy. And uh, then, of course, there's South Dakota Governor Kristi Noem and Byron Donalds, uh, Donalds of Florida, who I don't really know who that is. And finally, the last person he mentioned was Tulsi Gabbard of Hawaii. Now, I believe I've told you in the past that I thought she's going to be his choice. But he tossed out some names. So could those be the, one of those people be the name of the person that he plans to uh, choose as his vice president? I don't know. Is he playing games? Could be. Is he going to pick somebody nobody even, even thought of? Possibly. I mean, I'm still going with Tulsi Gabbard because I think she would be the best. She's, she looks good. She very photogenic, she's very positive, and she's a former Democrat, which would be a stone in the shoe of other Democrats. And she's currently listing herself as an independent. So those are the names of people that he said are in his short list, but I'm still riding the uh, Tulsi Gabbard uh, pony at this point. Not sure how it's going to end up in the furlong, but, well, eventually we'll f we'll find out, but Will it be her, or will it be someone that no one else even thought of? Right now, it's a game. That's the game we're playing. It's a guessing game. So let's keep guessing. That's all I got for right now. See you in a bit. Coming up next. Well, hello, everyone. Let's see what you think of today's issue. This comes to us out of the state of Colorado. I like Colorado. I have a younger sister who was born in Pueblo, Colorado, so I've lived in Colorado myself. Colorado's a very, very nice state. Well, used to be. But now it's turned into a big old giant blue state, and it's getting bluer by the moment. Here's the latest thing that was done by the Colorado Air Quality Control Commission. Air Quality Control Commission. Not elected. These, none of these people are elected. They're appointed. But what they did with an 8-0 to zero vote, 8-zip, are prohibiting gas-powered lawn and garden equipment used on public property. Now, you don't own public property, right? Of course you don't. But who's to say they can't extend that prohibition onto public or private property as well? 
You see, government has a funny way of doing things like that when they want to. The law doesn't mean anything. It means what they want it to and what they want to do, and they don't care who wrote what law that says you can't do it. They're going to go ahead and do it anyway. Now, that means that everybody, the public workers, are all going to have to switch over to electric vehicles. Now, you've heard of states, I think New York was one, that said all vehicles, all government-owned vehicles in the state have to be electric vehicles. Okay. That's what the state wants to do. That's what the state wants to do. But in Colorado, now they're saying on, on public land, not private property, all, all trimmers, all lawnmowers, all everything, all uh, chainsaws, you name it, have to be powered by electricity. Here's part of the problem with that. You're adding more to the electric grid than the grid is going to be capable of handling. Eventually, you're going to overload that grid, and the grid is going to shut down because the grid is not capable of handling all the electricity that government wants to put on it. But Colorado says, no, we're stopping pollution. Why, pollution is dangerous. Pollution is killing the planet. So let's say we got to tell the government, public, uh, the public property, uh, you must use electricity. Well, wait till they tell the average you and me, the homeowner, uh, you ain't allowed to use gas power to anything yourselves. That's coming. It's called Regulation 29. And it it's basically saying, hey, we don't care what you think. You're going to have to use electric things to mow the grass, cut the trees down, whatever, if you're a public servant, if you're on public property. But eventually, that will get down to you, whether you like it or not, because California has already done this. Californians are already told everybody, hey, no more gas powered. You got to run everything on electricity. Go at it, dude. Get your electricity plugged in because that's the way it's going to be. And now Colorado is starting the process. What starts in the West moves to the East. Get used to it because it's coming. Coming up next. Hello, everyone, and welcome into today's edition of the Pat White Show. And today we're going to be talking about a problem. If you have an iPhone, you may be suffering from this problem. It's a sound. It's like a chirping sound. And you're saying to yourself, where in the heck is this chirping sound coming from on your phone? And it probably just started recently. And you're going, it's a little peepy sound, a little, like a little chirp that happens when you're in the app Facebook. When you've got the Facebook app opened up on your screen, on your phone, suddenly you're starting to hear these little chirping sounds. Where's that coming from? It turns out it's a software. Something new they put in, and you need to turn it off or else it's going to chirp at you. The chirp means there's a new story that has been posted onto the, onto the application for Facebook. But if you, want to, if you want to keep it there, that's fine. But if you don't, I'm going to show you how to get rid of it. It's pretty simple and easy. First thing you do, open up Facebook. And as you can see, I have opened up Facebook on mine. In the bottom right-hand corner, just bottom right-hand corner, you All you want to do is just hit the button, because there's three bars there, the bottom right-hand corner, three bars, hit that bars, and then a new screen is going to open up, and you're going to see a whole, a whole series of things down there, and take a look for settings and privacy, and you want to just scroll it down a little bit, and there it is, settings and privacy right there, push that, another scroll down menu comes up, all right? Now you're there, select settings. Now you're going to go down a little bit, and here it is right there at the top. Right, says settings. See right there? Push settings. Now, I'm going to scroll down again. Got more scrolling to do on. And what's going to happen is you're looking for the word media. Scroll it down a little bit. You're going to see there's media right there. Push media. And bingo, that's the screen you want. Because about two thirds, almost all the way to the bottom, you're going to see a little thing that says stories start with sound. If that's green, you want to take that and flip it to the left with your finger and make it go dark. If it's green, you're going to get the chirping. If it's dark, it ain't going to chirp no more. 
That's what's going on with your phone. That's how you know that your phone has got that new software system added into it that makes it chirp on your iPhone if you've got the uh, Facebook app. That's what happens. Now you know. You know where the sound is coming from. And now I have fixed it for you. It's that easy, that simple. Just trying to make your life a little bit easier. That's what's going on. Hope it works for you. We'll see you. Well, that does it for today's edition of the Pat White Show. Thanks for tuning in and make sure to follow us on social media for the latest Pat White Show for all the news and updates. And stay tuned for brand new episodes of the Pat White Show coming real soon. Like what you're hearing? Make sure you don't miss an episode by following the Pat White Show on Spotify. Just search for the Pat White Show, hit follow, and get ready for insightful conversations delivered straight to your Spotify feed. If you enjoy watching podcasts as much as listening to them, good news! The Pat White Show is also on YouTube. Subscribe to our channel now for visual content, behind-the-scenes footage, and full podcast experience. Find us on YouTube at the Pat White Show channel. Happy